not going to work. That explanation will not fly. Uh, what's going to explain it is supply conditions back in Ireland and England and France, etc., that are constraining out migration. Uh, it's going to be a capital market that's very uh, poorly developed. So poor individuals uh, uh, in Ireland uh, cannot exit by uh, getting a loan, then making the move and repaying. I mean, who's going to make a loan to a guy who's going to go to Boston, right? I mean, what are my chances of getting the money back uh, from that? Um, so uh, you have to rely on family resources. And families didn't have the resources. They're poor. They're too poor. So th there's perverse result, right? I mean, the gains from the move are biggest for the poorest in the poorest countries of Europe. And they don't move because they can't. Uh, they're constrained by poverty. Uh, they cannot move. So the, the markets are failing uh, on this score. Same thing's true today. Uh, so there's something that might be releasing that constraint on, uh, on the poor. So that they now begin to move and you s start seeing large numbers in the mix of immigrants in coming into America. Um, okay. Didn't I just show you that? Uh, and I showed you that. Boy, there's a lot of repetition here. It happens when you get older. You start to repeat yourself. Uh, first is the falling cost of the move. Um, big changes in transport technology. They're, they're affecting trade. We've already seen that. It affects trade, but it also affects the movement of people as well. Um, so uh, the, and not only does it reduce the, the cost in steerage, because now they can just move people cheaper, um, and also, uh, the European outmigration use people as ballast. It's true, right? I mean, they load on all these guys on these boats because Europe doesn't have much except, you know, kind of textiles to send to the U.S. The U.S. has all this heavy stuff, grain and copper and all these heavy primary products. Well, bring over the immigrants as ballast and then dump the immigrants and then load on the grain. See, it works great. Uh, <laughs> works great. Uh, so all of these things are lowering uh, the cost, uh, the move a lot. Uh, and it's also true of those convicts going to Australia. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, Australians wouldn't admit if they had any convicts in their family tree. Now they're proud of it. I, I don't know how this happened, but <laughs> something happened. Huh? Um, OK, so these, the costs are undergoing a spectacular fall. Um, and. Um, Furthermore, the cost of getting to the European uh, court, uh, port, Naples or Hamburg or uh, Cork or wherever you're, you're, you're catching your, your boat to, to head to the New World, uh, that the cost of getting to them is going down. All those costs are going down. Um, so here's some, here some evidence on the cost of passage. Uh, and uh, the, so it, but it's taken relative to income per capita. So it's the cost of the ticket and, and all that relative to your ability to buy the thing in terms of your per capita income. It would be better if you had poor, poor earnings, but uh, hard to get that evidence. So as you can see, uh, up to about, uh, for in, the, in Britain, up to 1816 to 21, you know, that ratio is about a half. And then, boom, wow. Uh, what, two decades later, uh, it's dropped by to one quarter of that. So a big change, and there are two things working. One is the passage fare at the top is dropping, and the other thing is income per capita at the bottom is rising uh, to lower that ratio. So both of those forces uh, are at work. Uh, there are also subsidies involved. Uh, uh, especially for very long distance moves. Australia is a, a big one for doing that. Uh, uh, Brazil is uh, using the receipts from coffee exports uh, to subsidize immigrants that work in the coffee plantations. Um, uh, I just talked about that. They're pretty big. Uh, yes, I just talked about them. Um, these policies tended to reinforce really powerful self-selection that was going on. 
That is, uh, the folks from the top in Europe aren't migrating. Why would they? They're the landed elite and all the rest. Uh, uh, they have a good thing going. Why would they possibly want to leave? The ones at the bottom can't because they're too poor to invest in the move. So it's the ones in the middle that move. So it selects from the middle of the distribution. Um, and if you're as far away as Australia, it selects at the top of the middle of the distribution because only a very high quality are going to be subsidized uh, or can invest in the move. Uh, so there's a lot of self-selection. That's exactly the way it is in the Philippines now. It's exactly the way it is in Mexico now. They're immigrate, hollowing out the middle, hollowing out the middle, hollowing out the middle. Um, and we've been there and done that. That's uh, always been true. And now you know why. And it's conditioned by, uh, basically, by your ability to invest in the move. Uh, so those from the poorest countries will not move until they have a start of an industrial revolution. And those within any given country who are poor won't move uh, because they don't have the resources to move. So the poorest aren't moving. Um, OK, that's one story, uh, part of the story. Uh, that is, we've talked about declining transportation costs. Uh, we've talked about industrial revolutions beginning to increase real wages at home uh, and giving this um, kind of unpredictable result. If you were a good economist and you said, conditions improve at home, will, will it not keep more uh, potential immigrants uh, at home where the there are more good jobs? Right? That's standard economics. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong, as it turns out, because uh, it's conditioned by your ability to invest in the move. If your wages go up, there's more surplus in the household. The household set aside uh, the resources to buy a ticket for the eldest son uh, to go to Boston or Buenos Aires. And then he might remit uh, to buy the ticket for the next one, next sibling in line. But the constraint is on the family income to invest in the move. So any uh, emerging nation that starts getting quickening in the growth rates and industrialization uh, and, and expects that that will keep more uh, of, their, uh, of their young people at home will be disappointed. It'll quicken the out migration rate. And we see that country after country after country for two centuries. It's every, every single country, same thing. And we keep being surprised. Uh, you know, keep being surprised by this result. Why are we surprised by this result? Because nobody looks at history, that's why. So we got three questions here. Um, uh, in the case of the Irish, the Irish are the leading edge. They're the first Europeans to really exit in big numbers. And in the 1840s, the Irish potato famine, uh, an agricultural disaster, uh, and uh, it uh, forces this out migration. And uh, was it big in contributing for this larger change in mass migration? Yeah, it was. All the others are predictable economic and demographic forces. This one is a kind of random event, uh, and it kind of reinforced this transition. Um, and it had a very big impact. Uh, of course, once again, it, you know, is it those who were hit the hardest by the potato famine that left? No, uh, they just stayed there and died. Uh, it was only the ones who could just scrape up enough money uh, to get a passage from, from Cork to Boston and escape the, the famine. Um, so did it have a permanent impact on our, uh, uh, subsequent Irish migration? Yes. Uh, every single economy that's undergone an experience of out-migration undergoes the same, what we call the friends and laborers. What? It's not working? Somebody's waving at me. I wonder what. <laughs> friends and relatives effects. Um, uh, that is, it, it's a device that releases uh, the constraint, the, the budget constraint, the resource constraint, the liquidity constraint on poor households in sending countries. Remittances come in, they can use them in many ways. One of the ways they can use it is to invest in more uh, migrations abroad. Um, and that's always been going on. Okay, so uh, by 1860, we're in a new era. It's 
just taken three or four decades, new era. Uh, now we're in an age of mass migration, and the numbers are immense. Uh, uh, and they continue to get uh, uh, bigger and bigger uh, over time as the same economic and demographic forces uh, uh, are reinforced. I, I keep saying the demographic forces, I'll say more in this on the 17th of March, but um, the demographic transition that is correlated with industrial revolutions uh, is also playing a role. It's uh, with a lag creating more young adults, and of course those are the ones that move. Uh, and so that'll augment uh, the, the migration flows as well for emerging, uh, industrial emerging countries. Yes, yes, I said that. Uh, okay, so, uh, as I said, we're gonna return to these issues uh, in week after next, I guess. Uh, and we're gonna say all these, uh, these, uh, all these economics and demographic issues I've raised are gonna reappear again. Uh, and I think with even more power because we have more evidence to, uh, to, to suggest them. And selectivity will be an issue again. That's enough.